All right, welcome to the recorder's lecture. We will be briefly going over just in general what you need for a mouse and some other cool concepts, more advanced concepts and all that. Be sure to fill out our sign-in link here on the first side and then, uh, yeah, let's move on. And yeah, just an overview. So we'll be going over the power circuit, the microcontroller, the motors, the IRs and just other stuff. And yeah, in today our advanced topics will be diagonal LEDs, the curve turn and savings of flash. The diagram over there is just kind of showing how everything on the board is connected together. You have your batteries supplying power into the voltage regulator, which distributes power to the rest of our board and how the microcontroller is kind of the center between both like the IR circuits and just motors and reading information from that. And yeah, let's go into the power circuit. So here we're gonna delve a little bit into the RAT PCB we developed this year. And here's just a quick thing on our circuit with batteries and our test point. So we just have, we have the JS2 connectors to plug in our batteries. We have a switch, so the RAT is not always on. So you guys should definitely include a switch on your boards, please. And we have three test points just to just, just to see like what voltages we're reading. It's a good way to test to like hardware debug to see if it's like, oh, if it's your battery's running low or if something else is happening with the board. And yeah, here's our voltage regulator. We have an example one with the LD117, with the LD117 voltage regulator. And to be honest, it's not hard. Just set up as indicated in the data sheet of the voltage regulator of your choosing. All right, and yes, yeah, so that's the power regulator circuits. Um, hopefully that wasn't too bad, it's pretty simple. And then now we're getting into the motors. And then um, the motors that we have in MicroMouse, uh, these, uh, the, these are the ones that we give out in like the rat kits, um, like the beginner rat kits, and they are like a 30 to one gear ratio, six volts, um, maximum current, 0.67 amps, brush, uh, pretty simple. You guys should be pretty familiar with these. Uh, and then just a bit, or like we recommend still using the Palulu motors, but feel free to go out and look for your own if you so desire, but next slide. Uh, if, you, if you stick with Palulu motors, uh, just a quick bit about like the gear ratios and like um, what you might be looking for. Um, so yeah, the ones we use are the 30 to one gear ratio. And that's like a nice balance between speed and precision in our opinion. But like, if you wanna go like more, more precise, but with less, with a lower max speed, then we recommend like the 50 to one, 51 to one gear ratio. And then that would give like more, like uh, more precise meaning just like more encoder counts per uh, degree of like angular rotation. And then if you don't want your encoders to be as precise, uh, we don't really recommend this, but you could go for the 15 to one, 15 to one gear ratio. Um, that would just mean like your encoder counts and like your angular rotation might be a little bit less precise, but you would have double the max speed. Uh, and then in terms of actually designing your PCBs, we have a motor, a motor outline part uh, that we will give you. And then this just let you like see on your microcontroller, like where, or on your PCB, like where your motors will go, like make sure everything is placed well. You don't want anything to come in co into contact with these white lines because that means it will most likely touch the motor. Uh, and then also we have like the screw holes for you to screw the actual motor mounts onto the board, uh, which are like those yellow yellow circles with the dash across through it. Uh, so yeah, and then after that, we have our options for encoders. Um, yeah, so basically, if you stick with the Palulu motors, these are the two most common ones that Palulu sells for, for those motors. They just go right onto the back of the motors and you either get an option between the top entry or side entry ones. And then you can see from the image which ones are which. Uh, and then just keep in mind that this will, this will affect like how close you can place them together. Like if, for example, if you do side entry, then you can place, place the backs of the motors a lot closer to each other as opposed to if you did top entry because then those wires would be like pointed directly towards each other and would probably interfere. Uh, and then for the H bridge and the encoder headers, these are like example setups in the, in the Eagle schematic. Um, 
you you probably have different pins from us, but like this is just how we recommend setting up your circuit. And then if you want more information about like if you need a refresher for like how H bridges and encoders work, uh, be sure to check out our previous lecture, which the um, YouTube link is listed here. Uh, and then yeah, that's all we got for motors. And back to, uh, here we are with like our IR circuits. So we have our IR inverter circuits. It uses an IR LED to emit IR light. And we kind of turn it on and off with a transistor. And the reason why we use a transistor, the microcontroller doesn't supply enough current by itself. So we just use a transistor as a switch. And so general gist, if the microcontroller pin is high, the transistor is on and then the LED is high. If you want a refresher on both the IR emitter and then the upcoming receiver circuits, feel free to look through our previous lecture on IR circuits, also linked there and all that. And yeah, and here's our IR receiver circuit. It's a phototransistor to measure the reflected IR light, like you emit the light, it bounces off the maze walls, it's read in. And this basically sort of acts like a voltage divider. This, the phototransistor ha has some internal resistance and then the voltage between like ground and like the transistor is measured by the microcontroller's ADC. And that's how we figure out how far away we are from walls. And yeah, talking about the microcontroller, um, this we will give you guys like a, this is like a starter, a starter file that will have just like the, this microcontroller circuit and the, uh, like all the necessary hardware components plus just like the actual components themselves in the schematic um and then it will be up to you guys to like pick pick which pins will connect to where uh and then yeah next slide so yeah pick how you pick the pins is you go into the data sheet um basically you want to look for three things uh like which pins have like gpio ports which pins have um timer timer channels and then which pins have the um ADCs and yeah so, so yeah just go into the data sheet and look for those uh and then for the headers you'll have uh the one thing that you are required to have are is the um programming header because this is how you actually like to talk and upload code to the Mac controller uh so yeah you want to just set that up set that up how we um how we show here and then we also have the I squared C and you are UART headers, these are definitely optional, but if you choose to use the, the breakup boards that we mentioned later on, then uh, you definitely want um, to have headers or something to connect to the microcontroller with for those boards. And um, for picking for, for picking pins, like I was talking about earlier, just if you're lost, definitely check out like our previous, previous assignments and then our previous lecture for um, doing that. And then, and yeah, we're gonna start talking outside of the rat and we're gonna start introducing some more like other components and just cool stuff you can add to your board to make it really cool. And we're first off with LEDs. So you guys mostly know how it works. You run a current through it, put it in series with a resistor, it lights up. So when you're picking out your LEDs, pay attention to the forward voltage and the current draw. You can often round up the resistors because we don't need the LEDs to be glowing that brightly, that's up to you. And if you want more individual control, NeoPixels are a fun choice for just choosing between a variety of different colors for the LEDs to glow at and all that stuff. And buttons and switches, this allows users to toggle between different modes and settings. Make sure they're easy to reach on the board. You don't want it somewhere awkward like underneath your batteries, so it's just hard to reach. Um, dip switches are a space efficient way to add more user interfaces and it just gives you more control and just more settings to switch between and that you could set up in your software. And as always, when you're setting these up in your circuits, always, always add a pull down or pull up resistor to ground to prevent debouncing. Yeah. And Buzzers, you can use them as a status indicator or more. You can use them to play music and all that. And just a quick aside on the different types, active versus passive differs on what frequencies they can play. Active is set to one frequency, whereas passive can change frequency based off of the input. And for 
Pfizer versus magnetic buzzers, the main difference is that they generate sound using slightly different methods, but they functionally are the same. And similar to our IR emitter circuit that we saw earlier, we could turn buzzers on and off using a MOSFET. And for passive buzzers, have the MOSFET input be a PWM signal so we could change the pitch and frequency that it brings at. And as you can see on the right, we have a sample circuit from one of our suppliers from one of the buzzer manufacturers sheets. Like you could set up something like this and it should be fine on your board. And we have gyroscopes and IMUs. This gives us the angular, this gives you more information about how your mouse is moving by giving us angular velocity that we can track. And to get angular position, you will have to integrate the angular velocity in code. And what we recommend is the digital I squared C gyroscope breakout board. And our alternative is the analog Z axis gyroscope, which outputs a voltage based, outputs the voltage of the input based off the yaw. And it's space efficient, but it's kind of a hassle to set up and to solder on. And and we have more I squared C devices, like these are for like gyro breakout boards, OLED screens, and other displays. And the cool thing is you can connect multiple I squared C devices to the same pins of the microcontroller as each I squared C device has a unique address. And that is how we can tell it, that's how we can differentiate between each device. And yeah. And we have UART devices. We most commonly use them for our Bluetooth modules. The TX and RX are um, for transmit and receive. And for the, the TX of one device connects to the RX of another and vice versa. Don't connect a TX to a TX or RX to a RX. It just doesn't work out. And yeah, here we are to the advanced topics. All right. Um, and yeah, so I'm just gonna be talking about like some advanced topics that you could be thinking about when designing your boards um, or when you're programming them um, from a high level. Uh, so yeah. If you've ever like looked up like what um, competition mice look like, like the first place, blah blah blah, is um, they a lot of them have like don't have LEDs pointing directly to the sides like we have on our rat kits. They would have like two front facing LEDs, LED pairs, and then um, two pairs that look diagonally, like as shown in the picture. And then the purpose of this is it allows the mouse to know like the information about the walls before getting to the center of a cell. And I'm gonna show you what that means here. So yeah, let's say we're, we're in our start cell, like we start in the center of the cell. And then after that, we go, we move forward a, a bit to, until we're like, we're at the halfway point between where one cell ends and then another cell starts. So we want to know the information about the um, cell in front of us before we actually enter. And then using our diagonal LEDs, we can actually do that. So like we don't have to get to the center of the cell in order to read the wall information. We know, oh, there's no wall to the left, there's a wall in front of us, and then there's no wall to the right. So using that information, we know that like, oh, the only option for us is to go, is to turn left. So that allows us to um, perform a curve turn, where instead of getting to the center of the cell, stopping, turning nine degrees, and then uh, going forward, we just do it all in one continuous motion. And so you might be wondering, how do we actually do that? Uh, and then, so yeah, this, um, next slide. This is kind of a hassle to set up, but it's all in code. And you would use a good amount of math, but basically the, the idea is like, um, we know the, like, the radius of our turn. And so in order to attain that radius, we would need to, we need to be able to set the left velocity of the left and right wheel separately. So I could say like, oh, I want the right wheel to move at like 750 millimeters per second and the left wheel to move at like 250 millimeters per second. And then in order to implement this, you would need to create like a separate, or like change your current controllers or create a separate controller different from the distance and angular PID controllers that we've been using so far. And then after we have these controllers set up, we would need to calculate just like by hand um, what the desired speed of the inner and outer wheels are will be to achieve this turn. So what this math would actually look like was, let's just say 
we want our the center of our mouse to be traveling 100 millimeters per second throughout this maneuver. Um, and then we know we know based on like the dimensions of our maze that like uh, the radius of our turn is going to be 90 millimeters. And so if we're going like one fourth of the radius, aka 90 degree turn, um, we know that our dis total distance, the center of the mouse needs to travel is about 141 millimeters. So then um, we can divide the distance uh, by the speed to get that the entire maneuver will take about like 1.4 seconds to complete. And this information will come in handy when we calculate the outer wheel velocity and the inner wheel velocity. So um, because like, if you think about it, when we do a curve turn, the outer wheel will travel a, a wider distance than the inner wheel. Um, we first calculate the distance covered by the outer wheel um, using this. Uh, we assume that the uh, distance from the left wheel to the center is about like 40 millimeters. So that's where that W comes from. And then we get the outer wheel needs to travel around like 200, 204 millimeters. And then using that and at the time that we need, that we have to complete this maneuver, we can calculate the desired velocity of the outer wheel. And then same, same logic for the inner wheel. Um, and then, so yeah, we know the speed, of, the speed of our center, which is 100 millimeters per second that we decided on at the very beginning. And then from that, we get the speed of the outer wheel and the speed of the inner wheel. wheel. But remember that like these, we can't instantaneously set velocity. We have to allow it time to like start accelerating. And because of this, uh, that's why we split these sections into like A, B, C, D, E, like in these pictures. A and E, that's gonna be before and after the maneuver where at both wheels are going at the same velocity. And then um, in section C, that's when we've attained our desired speeds for the outside and the inside. And then B and D, that is where like we're gonna actually be accelerating and decelerating the wheels to achieve these velocities. Um, so that's like what it looks like from a high level. If you're trying to implement this, I definitely recommend going to like these two links that we linked on this slide. Um, but yeah, that's the idea of how curve turn works. And then, um, so yeah, this is about like saving your maze data to our flash memory. So as good as you can uh, code and like tune your mouse, there's always a good chance that you might crash eventually. So when we crash and like we click our reset button to just start our mouse over, uh, a lot of times we'll lose like all the data, like all the maze data, and then have to start exploring the maze all over again. We don't want to do this because that's a lot of wasted time during the competition. So uh, what we can do is like after a successful maze run, we can save all of the data like about the maze that we found on that run into our flash memory. So that even if we crash like right after that uh, and like turn the mouse on and off, we will still hold that data. And then the only way to, uh, the only way this data gets replaced is if you upload new code or if you rewrite this data. Um, and then yeah, well, to do this, we will use the how flash functions that SCM provides us. And then all the, in, this, in the next slides, like um, just know that all this information I found from the documentation in that link. Uh, and yeah, so just gonna go over what like a few of these functions do. Um, the, the flash array sector, the memory in um, the SCM32 F2 chips are arranged in sectors. You don't really need to worry about like what that looks like. Just know that we're going to erase the data that we're, or we're choosing the very last sector of memory. And then we are going to erase the data that was there before writing our own. Um, and then that's what this function will do. And then after that, next, we have our how flash unlock and then and lock functions. Basically, this is simple. Before we write to flash, we just need to unlock, unlock flash. And then before we, or after we have written everything, we would just lock. Uh, and then program, this is the actual thing we really care about. This is what we use to save data to our flash. So we can save it. Um, actually, first of all, this um, function takes in two arguments. One is like the, uh, the type of data that we're actually um, programming, whether it be like a byte, a half word, word, or double word. And then, uh, oh, sorry, on my bad. There will be three arguments. 
The first one is like byte, half word, word, and like what type of data. Uh, second one will be like the specific memory address that we um, will be want to write to. And then third will be the actual data that we're writing. Um, and then the data will have to match with the first argument of like what type of data we're writing. So if I want to write a 16-bit integer, um, then I will, in the first argument, I would just say like, oh, I'm writing a half word. And then the third argument will be that 16-bit integer. Uh, OK, and then yeah, this is what example code might look like. So in this code, we're saying that like maze data is a 16 bit, 16 by 16 bit, like, sorry, 2D array that's 16 by 16. And each of them is a 16 bit integer. Yeah. Um, and then um, because, because we're dealing with 16 bit integers, we are uh, telling our function that we're programming in half words because we're on a 32 bit system. So a half word, a half word would correspond to 16 bits. Um, so yeah, go. Uh, we have our start address at the top of this code. That's just like telling us we're, um, don't worry too much about this. If you're using an F2 chip, then um, this, this won't change. And then um, that's just telling us we're writing to sector 11, like the very beginning of that. Uh, and then in our write flash function, we unlock flash. We're clearing all the, all the flags. Don't worry too much about this. Just know that you need to do that before actually writing and doing anything with flash just to make sure there's nothing pending. And then uh, flash erase sector is what we talked about before. It's just, just erasing everything from sector 11 of the memory, which we don't care about. And then this for loop is where we are iterating through the 16 by 16 2D array of integers, and then just writing each integer one by one into the into the memory at the specified memory address. And like every time we write one in, one integer, then we go and move on, like you jump up to the next the next memory address, which is like um, four bytes or two bytes. Uh, yeah, jump up to the me next memory address and then write that next integer. Uh, and then after that, we lock the flash. So then that's writing to the flash. And then reading, it's pretty simple. Same, same logic with the for loop. We don't need to lock or unlock. We just, um, we have the the memory addresses of like where these integers are saved. And then remember that like, if you have a memory address, if you want to actually um, decode the data that's there, then we can treat the memory address as a pointer. And then we use the star operator to um, get that actual data. And then we save that to our maze data array. And then that will, when this function returns, it will change the data in maze data, because remember that in C and C++, when we pass an array, it's like, it's like passing a pointer. So when we update, update maze data inside the function, that's up, just updating um, maze data uh, from where we call the function as well. And yeah, so that's how we read from Flash. And yeah, if you, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment below. Uh, be sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. And if you want to see more content from us, yeah, well, that's it. That's all the content you're getting. <laughs> well, like if you guys want to show up to Floodville when we have it later on in the quarter, feel free. Otherwise, I don't know, ask us questions in Discord. Anyways, yeah. Thanks for watching. Yeah. Have fun designing your boards. <laughs>